Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Readings in Contemporary Poetry series. Uh, my name is Megan Whitco. I'm a curatorial associate at DIA, and it's great to have everyone here for tonight's reading. It's our second for the season and second in two weeks, so it's wonderful to kind of get some forward momentum here. Uh, DIA's Readings in Contemporary Poetry series was reinstated in 2011 in a partnership with uh, the series curator, Vincent Katz, and these readings are monthly and they highlight commonalities amongst poets and bring their work into a larger conversation with one another. So it's my great pleasure tonight to welcome our two poets for the evening, uh, Bill Berkson and Matt Longabuco. Thank you both for generously agreeing to be a part of the series. Um, and particularly, uh, Bill Berkson was originally scheduled for last fall, so we're exceptionally happy that he's uh, made it here tonight to be here at DIA. I also want to thank the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. Uh, their generous support helps make these evenings at DIA possible, as well as uh, thanking the Brooklyn Brewery for the cold beverages and our DIA staff, particularly uh, Claire, Sally, Kat, Patrick, and Max, who have kindly helped uh, coordinate tonight's program. Uh, so just sort of the order of business. So following the first reader, we'll have a brief uh, intermission before resuming with the second speaker. Um, and if you have a moment and you want to go ahead and grab, there are bookmarks slash coupons for Bill's new book, Expect Delays, out front, and uh, everybody should take that opportunity to grab one. So it's now my pleasure to give a warm welcome to Vincent Katz, who's going to introduce our first speaker of the evening. Thank you, Megan, and thank you all for coming out tonight. I just want to remind you of our upcoming readings. On March 10th, we have Clark Coolidge and Eddie Berrigan. April 14th, Peter Gizzi and the poems of Frank Andre Jam, translated and read by Norma Cole. And May 12th, Joanne Kiger and Stephen Motika. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Matt Longabuco. Matt Longabuco is the author of the chapbook, Everybody Suffers, the selected poems of Juan Garcia Madero, O'Clock Press, 2014. Other work has recently appeared in Capricious, The Brooklyn Rail, and Parquet. He's a co-founder of Wendy's Subway, a 24-hour library workspace and meeting place for writers, artists, and readers in Williamsburg. He teaches at New York University and lives in Brooklyn. Matt Longabuco mixes Elizabethan syntax with an ultra-current sensibility. He builds on the source, gathering energy and propulsive force. In his poem, In the Eight, he writes, Time I filled so faithfully at the desk or paying visits, guilt I endured like a soldier but in what army, hope I put into words not exactly, lust I divided like a bud of weed, leaf from stem. It keeps going, that's his gift, to push the poem along on one single breath, seemingly. To quote is necessarily to extract. Elsewhere, he is able to analyze succinctly what it feels like to be in a random contemporary space flung skyward by ether. The most important things I say, I say in texts sent, as so many are, at no special time, on what feels like a whim from his poem, Delayed Spring. In a long recent poem called The Misfits, Longabuco writes, I still want to write the poetry of street and bedroom, drink and cigarette, vampire and morgue. I can't say about the last two, but he's definitely got the first four sussed. To experience his top flight energy and wit, please help me welcome Matt Longabuco to Dio. Hi, thank you, Vincent. Uh, Vincent and I met at a psychedelic poetry reading not long ago, which was fun. Um, it's really an honor to be here. 
little sip, little nest where somebody slept, little underbelly of the teensy tiny BQE. I would never go in a restaurant unless you pay homage with me to relinquishing a barely earned dollar on hopeless non-cuisine. Elevate this, I'll promote you. What inside was battleships firing butterflies now plops out froyo, scoops chipped sandy mix-ins in. Ready-mades everywhere. You know so much more than me about Marilyn Monroe. When I look at her, I don't know where to look. The mole? I like when they apply one in the movies with a quick press of pencil to cheek. Signatures are getting weird. They make you do an electronic one at the store sometimes, and it comes out so shaky you look like an oaf. Or I guess the smart way to say this is that once again technology shames the subject, undoes it at the level of its own name, sends a tremor through the human hand, interferes with the slim calm whose source is the breath. That tropical plants and possibly dark green leaves, white ribs would so strike the fancy of my kiddo. Din downstairs of someone removing bottles from the giant bin of bottles. Wish I had money for new clothes and that no one will read this stuff unless it's late or they're drunk or away. Vigil. I saw you think I own you of me though I was faking having forgotten you, or probably because of this act. And along with the thought came a distinct smile, or really a series of them, mischief, triumph, ease, rue, going past on your lips like channels switching on a TV built for large data, but at the same time needing to gulp it painfully with each signal. Or maybe they weren't smiles at all, or registered unrelated data, in which case curse what's natural, or good, or real, natural good, or natural real, or good real, or natural good and real, or real good natural. Of course, they hold the morning, and we rule the night, but upon what hour will it strike, thy kingdom come? It's so dark with these new curtains, but in the time between when I flip off the light and we finish, my eyes adjust, can see your mouth, whose shapes I know how to read. I can't believe emojis are alienating us from our own faces. Perfect commodity because you didn't know you were buying them when you bought them. When you took on a new language without consent, hieroglyphs not from the past but the future, adorning the tombs of the empire of eyes. They're watching right now while I stand at the copier, scanning poems. Yo, my dean is a dick though. The Fragile Geometry of Space. I listen to these long poems everybody's writing and think about how much energy it took, right? Every equivalence you add being a light you must keep lit in a dream in which you are the keeper litter of 50 candles, all burning low, laid over a grid on a slate patio of great size, as of, say, a garden at Versailles. I'm thinking maybe the second or third garden out if you were looking from the vantage point of the palace itself's perhaps second floor window. Never been. The soul of meditation, make heat using just your head. I wanted to text someone I was here, but then waited and waited while in crystalline windows, sunbursts from street lamps revolved like ox cart wheels in a film. It'll never be that way again, the future in the other, will it? I tell my friend everything, I mean, when we have time. Tonight I won't wear tight jeans, just smear my legs with this gunk and munch a leaf from the tree the drunks all water the roots of. I ask my friend why we're not what we need to be yet. We speculate in a bar under the street about those defined by an act they hadn't recognized as final while it froze or closed. In the bathroom's less than mirror, I flop out my gray tongue and lift it to inspect the two black veins along its trunk. They look like the black banisters on subway steps. Steps a whole crowd presses up after departing a still waiting train, and one of the unborn, no matter how thin, turning his shoulders he tries to be, can't manage to pass through and descend to catch it. But another will be along, says my friend, then puts on a coat and hat straight out of the night watch. The 
the application. This is from my friend Kevin Kassam. Let's call this New York what it is, an artist's paradise. Of course, it's a city at its most repressive, but that's all the better for artists who must suffer those ingenious humiliations that, being irresistible to dream up, must really be the source of the new. Or what are you, the romance police? Kill the lights. Why else do artists proliferate? You know they gather here ever more quickly, thickly, in tight, contentious cells. Funny, punks disrupted the subway tonight, as in some older version. I thought I saw you as the car pulled away. The artists have three related problems, though each in itself spells ruin. First, the problem of capital, its inequity, the rule of corporate states and plight of the numberless refugees they produce. Second, impending ecological apocalypse created by the industrial age and perfected by a modern technocracy that is industry's avatar or its demon, Moloch himself, deranged by fire. Finally, the problem of the self lost in doomsday fog, unable to commit those acts of love and compassion that alone flash beacons of mind to mind. This nightmare, paralyzing, total, deep, admittedly thrilling, imagine losing everything, is what the artist now comes to the city to confront, what poets come to confront and change. We're always exasperated with poetry, but what is it? Nothing at all, just a room you must cross in the dark, not even to an illicit end, or only incidentally so. Poetry in all his spontaneity, poetry in all her attention. Like the sun and moon share the sky, persistence and arousal inhabit these and pass through, are passed around this very big bed we've all climbed into, not unlike the night we had enough knees beneath the sheets to make the great chain of the Andes appear. That changes nothing. And that changes nothing. Everyone gets their question, but why is mine this sordid business about whether getting counts? Remember that misunderstanding, how it flew straight to the heart of substance? Regards to those strangers who seem for all the world like they're about to break character, step out from the blare of traffic and hectic sunshine and speak in slow motion, their lips in close-up filling the frame. I tried so long to get you to break the rules, but like the second we reached their far side, we felt itchy, infected, Maybe that had been the moment to part ways, go home not with each other but with the rules. The rules understand us and fit as though custom cut. It was a doomed summer as soon as from a bookseller's table outside Bobst, that Shambhala classic, The Sacred Path of the Warrior, pretty much leapt into my hand. But on the crowded train hid in my palm, what prick of irony when Chogyam Trungpa says the warrior's never embarrassed to be alive. The part where he talks about how when you dress yourself or put on makeup, you're dressing or making up empty space. Bright red wedge of lipstick drawn slowly and steadily over air, less than air. Erica reminded me how controversial he was, sleeping with students, drinking himself to death. He found in Naropa, and even, or of course, the poets divided over him. A warrior, hard term to swallow, with the same astringent aftertaste the feudalism of the tarot sometimes leaves though in this case it means someone meek, perky, outrageous, and inscrutable. Humility is armor that's not armor. Sudden delight is a sword. A bodhisattva who wants more than anything to wake us up may seem flippant, wanton, or like a clown. And as the great Bolivian Sayans writes, the most painful, the most morbid and terrifying experience imaginable comes by grace of alcohol, and any walking stiff who wants it can get it. It opens door after door. It's an authentic path to knowledge perhaps the most human of all, though perilous and extremis. I remember that hot, aimless night my friend wrote each of our names in Sharpie on our sweating beer cans. Not a year later, and I don't even talk to the guy. Beyond the city limits, no one remembers the reasons for city feuds. And in travel's relentless interpolation, one's pockets fill with receipts till at the end of the night, above the hotel bed's tight, tucked floral print comforter, they all get pulled out and tumble down like it's a fucking ticker tape parade. This is called In the Eight. Time I filled so faithfully at the desk or paying visits. Guilt I endured like a soldier, but in what army? Hope I pinned on a flat, flat lever. Lust I divided like a bud of weed, leaf from stem, or consecrated in a succession of private galleries. 
empathy I humored like an out-of-town visitor, or worse, a visitor from the tri-state area, who, as you once astutely put it, comes in search not of his hosts, but of portable enlivenment. Despair I thrashed beside as if we were two bedmates who alternately sleep, pretend to sleep, dream, pretend to dream, awaken, pretend to awaken. Vanity I could hardly conceal, but can any obligation be concealed? No, there are contracts stating the first party will incur a penalty, only one for whom the future is without attachments would dare to incur. Fear I meant to outwit, knowing full well it was the flesh of my wit, and its skeleton as well, the synapse of my understanding, and its divine current. Love I drank like beer and steam, or rum and fiddling, or vodka and bushwick, or coconut water and tardiness. Conviction I coveted, excellence I bookmarked, success I reframed downward, Passion I had to forget everything to recognize, the way the scanner forgets the identity of the patient who suffers its verdict. Stillness I couldn't reconcile in you until I had to change my mind, not about you, but about stillness. Righteousness I hid from beneath a bridge while the royal carriage clattered past above. Mischief, a disparism followed as in the wanton melting down of plastic soldiers, at least one of whom executes a perfect forward fold. Ritual I established, or violence I finally gave, in its at least rhythmic turmoil, the wish I was still protecting in this way from the more vacant desert, desert of fish bones and formations so primal only a pastry chef in a time of ascendant decadence could mimic them unconsciously. Purpose I guarded, betrayal I laughed off, but we know that's not true. Fatherhood I let bleed into friendships and affairs. Childhood I visited in the descriptions of those whose preternatural concentration could restore its sun, wind, rain, snow, paper, fabric, sickness, sport. Desire I knew was elsewhere. I pretended, but I knew this. You'd have to be an insect. You'd have to be inside the walls. You'd have to see up close into the shit or savor what it's of. Joy I stumbled under its web of clear green mucus frozen like a spider web between skyscrapers, the only foliage in January air. Death I let nibble me, and smile when I think of having let it. Today I'm the idiot, grinning at some private thought, sitting beside you, or swaying on a pact with sighs and snorting A. Um. I'm just going to read one more of this sort of longish poem called The Misfits that um, Vincent quoted a couple of lines from. The Misfits. Theory and literature. But any dummy knows how time works. Or put it this way, if you get lost, it's the easiest thing to jump back in. December 22nd, a Monday, a cartoon episode entitled Frenemies and organic lucky charms for my daughter before I bundle her into winter gear, off to school, and out of this poem for as long as possible, since her presence here inevitably registers as both light and silly, but also, I suspect, somewhat pious, signaling an identity as doting father that along with professor and other markers I'm increasingly feeling as reductive and claustrophobic, maybe because I fear them as precisely constitutive and true. Besides, she'll be back. Besides, it's hardly her fault, our ambivalence about dads. Little droplets cling to wool, quiver while I walk to LabCorp on 12th, but I've never been to this location. They want my insurance card. I didn't bring it. They don't care about what I did fucking remember, not to eat, and the carbon copy thingy from my doctor. Storm out, get in everything with cream cheese and have the presence of mind to look at it once between desperate bites as I cross the floor of Bope's library and picture all the sesame seeds, poppy seeds, and flakes of charred garlic falling to the marble's speckled surface to be absorbed. I've come for two items. The first, a DVD of Olivier Asayas's late August, early September, in order to revisit a scene I was moved to recall while reading a long passage in Karl Ove Knausgaard's novel, where his friend describes him as fundamentally an innocent, or rather one in search of innocence, so much so that his life of sacrifice, duty, and joyless patience re represents an affront to the modern obsession with acquiring the most and most various experience as the unquestioned objective of a worthwhile life. His character, shaped by this anachronistic value, is guileless, a mnemonic, ironic for the writer of a six-volume autobiography, and repeatedly shocked upon the revelation of the hidden lives of others. Too bad he doesn't know Karen, whose precept, she confides, is that everyone's on drugs and everyone cheats. In the film, Mathieu Amalric's character, uneasy and lost, is in love with Virginie Le Doyen, mercurial and troubled, or what am I saying, She's always dashing into the store for a scratch-off called Taco Tech, 
furious at diffident Amalric, she flips over a table, then slips and winds up with arm punctured and bloodied by the litter of broken glass, turns weirdly calm. They part. Later in the film, we encounter her again at her boss's apartment, having sex with him and someone else. She's on all fours in one shot. Afterwards, her boss unties her. She tells him she likes the way he fucks her. Emma Reek adores her too much, she says, to give her anything but straightforward physical pleasure. For her, she admits with melancholy, it's not enough. I still want to write the poetry of street and bedroom, drink and cigarette, vampire and morgue, transit across the room of a figure in a dress that, by echoing two or three seasons in different eras, cancels them all with the mystery of an eclipse. There's booze and there's breaks from booze. Crossing town in this endless rain, I smelled before I saw the pool of bullet bourbon whose telltale orange label still adhered to shards being kicked under a delivery truck by the driver who'd let the bottle drop and shatter. Emma Reek never finds out. There's enough gossip in my notebooks to publish a gazette someday. I can be tribal as fuck and never forget a slight. Kafka thought it would be funny to show up at the Trocadero in Prague at 5 a.m. and pretend he was a dissipated millionaire who'd been up all night. I'm at the library to find him, too, having come across a certain passage over the weekend in Roberto Colasso's Ardor, a volume devoted mostly to the ancient Vedic people of northern India, the greatest civilization to leave nothing behind, or actually they left one thing only, their sacred text, much of it devoted to elaborate methods of sacrifice, itself devoted to the regulation of human anxiety over an equation stated with perfect concision by Clark Gable in The Misfits, nothing can live unless something dies. Colasso quotes a dialogue in which Gargi, a theologian and weaver, asked first with what weft time was woven. Yajnavalkya, master of the sacrifice, answered, with the weft of space. But Gargi still had her second and last question in reserve, with what weft is space woven? To which Yajnavalkya answered that the weft of sp space was woven on the indestructible. To this already mysterious exchange, Colasso appends his own enig enigmatic note. Many centuries, almost 30, were to go by before that indestructible would again be described with similar authority in the aphorisms that Kafka wrote at Zurau between September 1917 and April 1918. Zurau was in West Bohemia, Old Europe, in what's now the northern highlands of the Czech Republic. His sister Atla lived there and took in her brother when his tuberculosis first announced itself, in life as in the movies, in bouts of coughing up blood. I know where to locate Kafka, but note the exact call number, PT2621A26Z46-2006. Ride the elevator to eight where the tables are removed and step stools and chairs pushed into the stacks. While the students are on break, the staff polishes a semester's worth of scuff from the tiles. Climb over two chairs, they have wheels I nearly slip. Make it into the aisle, follow the numbers to the far end, then have to swivel another chair aside, unwittingly raking its broad back along a shelf of books that tumble down in a heap I ignore. Lean over, of course it would be the bottom shelf, and see that the volume, though listed as available, isn't there. I clamber out again and proceed dutifully to the processing room. Ask the woman placing books on carts to be reshelved if she minds if I take a look around. Track down the PTs, see Kafka, he featured or starred in someone's final paper, but no aphorisms. Instead, I Google September 1917, and the third result catches my eye. Entitled Apparition of September 13th, My Birthday, it links to a description of the fifth appearance of the Virgin Mary to three Portuguese siblings, along with 30,000 pilgrims who had by this time heard of the visitations and gathered, says the site, despite the ridicule and jokes of the secular atheistic press. The Virgin spoke through the eldest child, Lucia, prophesying, among other things, the end of the war, as well as the deaths of the other two siblings, both of whom were indeed carried off, or what am I saying, two years later by the flu pandemic. Lucia lived to age 97 and visited Fatima a number of times in later years in the company of several popes. Anecdotal evidence, the day's texting, leads me to believe this holiday season is more a more than typically unhappy one. People seem determined to unearth and worry past wrongs or mark the end of untenable relations. Judah joked on Facebook that we're all just lingering after the rapture. Seems right. We have no apparent purpose. It's as though the great engine slowed and stopped, or its belt snapped, or pistons fused, if that's a thing. You could walk out to a quiet spot under the stars and you'd no longer hear a hum. Open your mouth for, to argue for pleasure and no sound comes out. To tell about my dream, I have to talk about Twin Peaks. Been watching again. Just saw the one where they're close to catching Bob and Major Briggs tells Agent Cooper to go, if he must, to the rim of the volcano i.e. approached by any means and despite the danger, the principle of evil that Laura Palmer inherited, seduced, and fled into death. 
I don't think I much cared about Agent Cooper in 1990 at age 16, when I was infinitely more compelled by Machin Amick and especially Cheryl and Fenn, who featured in a Playboy my father purchased to give to me, had I asked, and whose glossy pages I turned for two or three delirious, dry-mouthed days before my mother quietly made the issue disappear. My sex life since consists merely of embellishing that fraud affair. <laughs> now I can see Cooper's at the same time dedicated and joyous, and wears lightly the mysticism that, the show argues, is in fact the only path to a solution of the crime that would deserve the name. Of course, I too want him to stand at the rim of the volcano. Took note of this phrase, even went to bed and dreamt last night that civilization neared its final breakdown, and people around me were aware of this, had known it was coming, as we do know, but found themselves unprepared anyway for a moment that arrived as if from the distant future, dramatized in the dream by the power going off with a sudden, sickening thunk, lights out, and the knowledge that this was not the power in the house or the surrounding blocks, but everywhere, the grid, as they say, having limped along on patchwork fixes and deliveries of fuel, now failing for good, and with this, the realization that in the night and nights ahead, there would reign a new terrible law. And I looked around at my loved ones. It's too painful to write whom exactly. And in a vision within the dream, imagined their unutterable degradation in body and soul. And from that dread awoke and was in my bed in the early morning. So exhausted, I immediately wanted to shut my eyes and return to sleep, except I knew that the dream was still close. And that if I slept, I'd rejoin its progress, wherein salvation was a pretty fiction of an age that had gone dark along with the fridges and phones and watch in its theater the pageant of atrocities I'd so far only glimpsed. And refusing to do this, sat up very consciously remembering the rim of the volcano image and thinking how I'd failed, watching the episode of the show on my little laptop to realize what that really meant, but had somehow forced myself to confront it in the dream. A mashing sound, a ceaseless sawing, a soft nibbling of vermin building to an uproar, a pitiless visitor who never rests or departs the vent or midden within. I must have been rattled, too, when we'd gone to meet baby Isaac in bed the day before those two police officers had been shot, execution-style, in their squad car that very hour and four blocks away by the man who fled to the subway station where he took his own life, or what am I saying? The day after New Year's, I'm moving to that neighborhood of majestic MP3-length streets with little but clothes and books, the futon I bought from Dottie, two dressers, and a Danish chair I purchased randomly from someone online who turned out to be Dynasty Handbag, and possibly a queen-sized mattress donated to my cause by my ex-wife's new boyfriend, strictly contingent on my ability to accept that we're all a village. <laughs> it's the morning of Christmas Eve, weirdly warm, a gray sog bog outside, texts Charity, who also reports when she brought Jonas Mikas a huge gingerbread cookie for his 92nd birthday, he filmed it. Here's the 66th Zurau aphorism. He is a free and secure citizen of the earth, since he is bound by a chain long enough to allow free access to every place on earth, yet short enough that nothing can drag him beyond the earth's confines. But at the same time, he is also a free and secure citizen of heaven, since he is bound also by a heavenly chain that functions similarly. Thus he is choked if he tries to move toward the earth by his heavenly collar, and if he tries to move toward heaven by his earthly one. And despite this, every possibility is his. He can feel it. Indeed, he refuses to trace this all back to an error made by chaining him in the first place. Determined, joyous zone of action. Could it be better depicted? Moving is hard. My kid stands lost in thought holding the subway pole, her hand the lowest in a tower of hands, that local deity. I can't decide how strenuously to insist she express thanks for Christmas gifts she doesn't like. I want her to be grateful and polite, of course, but it's strange to overhear oneself explaining the logic of a lie. We've never gotten into the whole story. So far, lambs are just lambs. Then on the holiday, she gets a pile of packages, is delighted. Right before dinner, I half ask my father for the Robert Dash lithograph, currently and for years hanging unlooked at in his hallway, poster-sized image of a window opened outward, with houses, trees, and shrubs indicated beyond as black shapes, the lintels of the window also black and the negative space all white. There's a line of poetry on the bottom. The air is like a Christo mint. He doesn't respond, but you never know. My mother brings it up again, twice, enough that maybe sometime soon he'll decide it was his idea and fork it over. If he does, I'll hang it in my new place and daily follow with my eyes its contours into the plane they affect, like leaning forward while the film plays to take a sip of whiskey from the screen. Thank you. Bill Berkson was born in New York City in 1939. 
He moved to Northern California in 1970 and now divides his time between San Francisco and New York. He's a poet, critic, curator, and professor emeritus at the San Francisco Art Institute where he taught art history and literature for many years. He's been a corresponding editor for Art in America since 1988 and has contributed to the journals Art Critical, Art Forum, Aperture, and Modern Painters. His recent books include Snippets for the Ordinary Artist, a collection of his art writings, uh, several collaborations with artists, with visual artists, Portrait and Dream, New and Selected Poems, published by Coffee House Press in 2009, and his most recent book of poems, Expect Delays, published by Coffee House in 2014. Bill Berkson's poetry has the air of a parlor game or of high-end repartee. In case some may have forgotten, an article states, parlor games competed for attention with the mass media, particularly radio, movies, and television. Many parlor games involve logic or wordplay. Others are more physical games, but not to the extent of a sport or exercise. Some also involve dramatic skill as in charades. Most do not require any equipment beyond what would be available in a typical parlor. Parlor games are usually competitive, but cumulative scores are not usually kept. The length and ending time of the game is typically not set. Play continues until the players decide to end the game. In other words, an attempt is made in Berkson's poetry to use one's wits to test the limits of language's expressive quality, to express the social good manners of entertaining one's audience, to think on one's feet, and to provide an alternative to the relentless dumbing down of our culture, and perhaps all culture, is falling into. Among Berkson's many achievements as poet, editor, publisher, critic, and teacher, one of the most signal was his ability to mark out his own territory from the get-go. One can imagine it might have been difficult in the bright light of the New York school's heroes with whom Berkson was fast since his early days as a writer, not to be overly influenced by their genius. Instead, Berkson took whatever lessons he learned and struck out on his own into the terrain of poetry. Presumably, he was impressed as much by his mentor's insistence on finding one's own path as by their specific phraseology, and he knew enough to avoid the pitfalls. This classic apprenticeship paid off, and Berkson's poetry took a new turn into contemporary language via the actions, poetic and otherwise, of the 1960s. Berkson's publications from the late 1960s to the mid-1980s brought into one's consciousness, as I have written elsewhere, an awareness of his poetry as an ever overlapping opening up of a poetics, based in the rolling waves of New York school's surf, yet mellowing out on the mesa of the poet's colony of Bolinas, California, recovering, as it were, from the clamor and degradations of the big city's cutthroat modus operandi, discovering a more open daily expanse. For this reader, the most powerful of Berkson's poetry occurs when he's found a way to boil down the experimental into a connection, usually with a person, sometimes to a memory or present observation. In his most recent poetry, Berkson keeps stripping down the emotion more apparent, but always alive with the knowledge that this life needs to be played with a lightness that allows one to navigate around the edges in a typically surprising passage, Berkson highlights the ampersand in a newlywed couple's address. Just as you were saying your mutual I do's, infinitesimal bingo, twas the enamored cosmos sounding off in perfect pitch. My loves, I heard it humming plainly, marriage on earth has this huge, undeniable ampersand in it. The ampersand of dailiness and rapture of wow and whoops, of piecemeal logic and postprandial why not, so on and etc. 
If you are ready for some wow and whoops and some pre or post prandial why not, some dailiness and rapture, please help me welcome Bill Berkson. I don't know how it goes. Maybe it's, um, is it come into my parlor, says the spider. <laughs> if you like. Um, thank you, Vincent. And thank you all for being here um, on this wintry, uh, balmy night. I'm going to read mostly from uh, uh, this new book uh, that Vincent mentioned called Expect Delays. Um, but this one comes from elsewhere. Um, well, don't they all? Robert Rauschenberg once said, my painting has always been an invitation to look elsewhere. <laughs> so, in one of the great cameo film performances ever, uh, you know, Painter's Painting, if you get a chance to see that, it's, on, it's available. After the Medusa, I have to spring lightly to make or thwart of meaning, bare thump at the Safeway's automated door, birds in their vanishing act above or near the U.S. mint. My mistake, I holler, but poetry comes first, democratizing confluence despite terror, greed, no big deal, larger than life or death, I hear fifes in the outward calm, granite humps and chins, sweet, sizable orpiment, seldom repetitive, unsaying the echo. I lugged this book all the way down here to just read that one poem from it. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty willful. <laughs> um, Oh, really? I don't think it goes that well. I have to look up this. Hmm. I had the wrong page number here. Oh, here it is. Premises of the solstice. Eastern sky at morning, all peaches and cream. Streaks of late night promise athwart the, do the dome of heaven, casually fulfilled. And the next poem um, has an epigraph. It's an exchange between Nikolai Bukharin and Joseph Stalin. Um, uh, when Bukharin is in the Moscow trials, he's going to die. He knows it. He's going to be executed uh, for uh, treason uh, against the party. And uh, at one point he says, um, you must understand it is difficult for me to die. And Stalin uh, replies, and it is easy for us to go on living? <laughs> or maybe the other way around. I've lost the thread, something about evil days, evil ways, business as usual, the kids, their schools, and the infernal machine. Difficult it is, regardless of what is said or put to writing in the end. Say we do as we please, tacit approval of a faulty transcription, sentence taken down in a kind of rapture.
Um, that last line, an account of rapture, I had read that uh, it was another word that she used, but Hannah Arendt, uh, after the, during the big uh, uh, simus uh, over um, her book, uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem, uh, wrote to her friend Mary McCarthy and said, uh, it was as if people should realize that I wrote that book in a kind of ecstasy, is what she said. And, but ecstasy didn't fit the poem, so. It's interesting. Monogram. This is dedicated to Bernadette Mayer. Just one more vintage movie, Bat Wings Tonight at the Bal Masque, another of Earth's, Earth's creatures stuffed by distinguished pedigree. I get a lot of madcap ideas about sentience. How knowing you has you put down in the book forbidden speech recognition, else why make such a face? And now it's luck, no longer mouth that moves when fastidious rummage whispers to divulge a surplus, a clue, if not the key. Prospect my question laps up for good. I lean to it knowing you, first person dwindle. Tweet, tweet, prick. Um, I was um, asked, I like to say commissioned, um, I love it. There, there was a um, conversation between John Cage and Morton Feldman at some point, it must have been in the 1970s, and they were talking about how often the phone rings and how often it's about uh, being called upon to uh, participate in a panel discussion or give a lecture. And then Feldman says to Cage, John, do you write music anymore? And, and, and Cage replies, I do when they ask me, <laughs> which is sort of about commissions, but has nothing to do with this. Um, this poem uh, was commissioned by the Al Al Albright Knox um, Gallery in Buffalo. Uh, they wanted to, uh, Douglas Dreisboon, the curator there, uh, ha uh, had just um, succeeded in acquiring for, the, for that museum uh, an Anselm Kiefer uh, painting, which is about the size of this wall. But here, you know, is the reproduction of it. Uh, and, you know, it's a flower painting. Uh, uh, but it's called uh, De Morgenthau Plan, the Morgenthau Plan. And uh, so the, the, the way I understand it is uh, that these flowers were, uh, are in, um, they sort of look like stalks at this point, in Kiefer's backyard somewhere. He has a lot of houses. And, uh, and he photographed them and then he painted the photographs, and then he decided to make bigger and bigger paintings. And those were shown, I think, uh, in one of the big, big, big galleries about five years ago. And, um, but the, you know, then he said to himself, I don't, you know, I am, I don't do flower paintings. Um, I make big, meaningful paintings about history. And so um, he had to make these flower paintings jump to the tune of, you know, history. And so he uh, thought about um, uh, uh, Henry Morgenthau and how he, in about 1943, proposed that, because it was pretty clear that Germany was going to lose the war, uh, that, uh, there, that the Germany should be um, changed, um, limited to being a, an agrarian economy, no industry. So then they wouldn't go to war again. I guess that was the idea, you know, as if what they got in World War I wasn't bad enough and caused World War II in some large measure. 
Um, so uh, that was the, that's the scheme, you know. And uh, actually, it turned out that uh, one, news of this got to people like, or in particularly Joseph Goebbels, who, I mean, this scheme, who used it as propaganda to keep Germany fighting because, you know, otherwise you're going to be reduced to this, right? Uh, but, uh, and then uh, at the end of the, the very end of the war, after the German surrender, apparently the plan was sort of inched into action, but then withdrawn and replaced, you know, really by the Marshall Plan, you know, and the economic miracle that ensued. So, they, you know, sort of interesting. Anyway, my poem is called Floral after Anselm Kiefer, Kiefer, and if that's not enough, it's got, <laughs> it's got, a, uh, it's got a, uh, an epigraph from W.H. Auden, uh, um, perhaps the roses really want to grow. The flowers went away because nobody saw them. An ill wind took precedence over the torpor. History intervened, the clouds blinked, interspersed with azure above, in the fait accompli under Eden, during Mother Nature's modernist phase. Not like today at the Hamburger Bahnhof, starrier than green goo were the fruits of revenant labor. No home for, for an offspring to be stalked through the blind mall in the golden age of myth, in the peaceable kingdom, hour of the wolf, cute shit, tooth and claw under heat lamps and the surplus. You tricked us, Erat, salute, after which perpetual complaint is just another dirty ocean being born. They brought it on themselves, quoth Granny, on the cylindrical sofa jam. Just a rental, anyway. You tell me the flood isn't really a river, the flaw stays in the picture, the painting within the painting, 74 years in person, creationism outmaneuvered, as in 12 scenes of famous mountains, brings back memory, see your life stop at the sign that says it all. The pictures all fell off the cliff, befogging the turnstiles, horrific certainties in a state of dubious national storage. Substitute for a maquette, the whole rainbow came crashing over the bounding main and ended, turrets expectorating into the blue handkerchief wafted in from the bordering crowd, emotion left behind. So like the automatic writing that is history. It certainly seems long ago, what if the flowers had to grow? Throw them into the sea or on the tops of mountains. Cruelty wears its sensible mantle of sludge, suffering no fools among the disfigured guests. Politically honest as the deadly night nightshade. Fair is fair, but where is light? Who owns gravity? Can truth stop making sense? Garden in such a mess you would flush it to. Nobility and virtue battle perfidy. One has a wounded thigh, another a skin flap that ascends like a sandcastle from the thought of solid ground. In all fairness to the Muzak, the delicious tagine, the hump. Golden stupa of the world, you place your bet on sanctity, observable, observable hence out of reach, decisively from this slab to stomach it. Gratitude reaches the finish line where guesswork meets revelation that through ambient fractures to collate intelligibility with happenstance. Glasses clink, beasts resettle on the banks. You get everywhere without meaning, bleed yourself on a wall. Fruition clears the table, unlikely specimens abound. 
I, th I think the nice thing about commissions is that you get to write something that you have never written before and would never write again. <laughs> and I really had, I mean, I, I, I had to contend with that insistence on a kind of, you know, on imposing a meaning that the artist had, you know, and then deal with his scale in a way. Um, so I did. Lady Ayer. The meaning of guitar practice slips between pine needles, a bird that thin, to the tune of Start Me Up. Rubrics of screen porch and firefly embolden the effort. All words are prophetic. Bear the thread, swallow the cloud. Reflected glory drives off, leaving the original behind. Repeat after me. Need to wet the whistle. This is called Reprise, and it was a, a, a sort of impromptu response to um, somebody in a conversation I I, I, I was recalling the effect that movies had on me as a child, uh, seeing people kiss, and, uh, and, and, and then, uh, you know, uh, everything seemed like it was going to go on forever uh, happily. Happily ever after. Don't you know that feeling? After many difficulties, the two stars are kissing with their eyes closed and the music swells. The screen says the end in big block letters. Happy ending, you're set for life. In the seats, everyone is choked up, crying for the happiness such prolonged kissing promises. Meanwhile, kissing itself is amazing. I got completely lost in it. I went out and started kissing anyone I could find. Who? I always had good taste in women. I was going to read that poem that Vincent uh, read, but he read the, the best of it, and I'm not going to read it. Uh, but I'm going to read another. That was an acrostic, uh, as in a series of acrostics that are sort of in the midst of this book. And, um, but I'm going to read uh, a double valentine for Connie. Can you see yourself with me on earth where we'd be next to one another, say? Never go away. I could with you, ever eager, ecstatic too. Canubial are we on air, land, and sea. Nearly inseparable, nearness is free, illumines the house. Days, nights as close, endless even as starlight goes. And then, sort of further in the middle of this um, book, uh, is this sequence of three arrangements made from um, a kind of notebook that I kept on my le uh, computer desktop for a number of years. And um, I started progressively arranging them, not in chronological order. It's not a diary or a day book or anything like that. but. Um, the, the cumulative title is Songs for Bands. Um, and I realized that, uh, so there are three of those uh, groupings, arrangements, but uh, in reading, uh, I, I, uh, I've come to understand that they're sort of endlessly uh, reshuffleable. I mean, I can keep making new arrangements, and I like to do that in the in the readings, and actually tonight I'm going to try to go break the even the order of the page, 
you know, the pagination and, and, and go back and forth a little bit, hopefully without confusing myself or you too much. Many loves, name one. Bright yellow, soft green, crimson and gold, brown and gray, mouse brown and dirty yellow, magenta and purple, golden rod, obsidian and ebony, red and blue, green, cerulean, chocolate brown and pale gray, khaki and brick red, lilac, sepia and moss, orange and white, ochre and cream, pink and tan, celadon and ivory, shit brown, cerise, plum and puce, peach and black, indigo, flesh, ultramarine. The street has many still lives. Tell, I don't want to tell of something in the way of dictating a point of view, but to tell like beads, the words, phrases you can turn here or there towards what might want to be said, feelings drawn from words, expressivity in reverse. Not ap applicable. He is living proof that narcissism is an incurable disease. <laughs> all, 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 everything, and one, variations on a theme. Quote from Edwin Denby, meaning is a peculiar thing in poetry, as peculiar as meaning in politics or loving. In writing poetry, a poet can hardly say that he knows what he means. In writing, he is more intimately concerned with holding together a poem, and that, for him, is its meaning. Erratic. Why are you, why are you so erratic? one of my prep school teachers demanded, confronting me in the corner of the library. I had to err to get anywhere, apparently. <laughs> you don't have to be Martin Heidegger to know that philosophy is always already nostalgic for poetry and art criticism for philosophy and so on around the bend. The ages, whenever I see woods and fields, warriors huddle, dart and scatter, running, shooting, shaking their clubs. November, the movie cannot be opened. The documentary tells how trench warfare afforded soldiers a deeper appreciation of sky views, such vistas being the only ones they had to gaze upon beside the horror of the immediate pit. Egoics. The family dinner I try to envision, actualize the mortality enveloping the room that is the room, the married couples nitpicking over kitchen details, the little kids pursuing their pleasures, me on the sofa, an observer, can't. Only Connie, her great combination of steady goodwill and basic dolor is unmistakably real. That old condition, though, for everyone, dead and don't know it. We poets in our youth begin in gladness, but thereof come in the end 
despondency and madness. William Wordsworth. Taint necessarily so. Ira Gershwin. The Social History of Art, Pasternak on Mandelstam, he got into a conversation that started before him. <clears throat> and Mandelstam, my breath, my warmth, has already lain on the pains of eternity. Circus Maximus, Karlsruhe Castle, First the bombs fell, targeting the munitions dump at the edge of town. Post-war, the annual flower show took over. The International Art Fair soon followed. History. For a snippet. For openers, to be in love with words and hate the use that's made of them. December 24, the world is running out of ice. The ice man goeth. <laughs> Charles Baudelaire, the George Washington of modernism. <laughs> the modern soul went out in search of a self to come home to tufts of what you wanted, because tufts are all you ever want, and the fruits thereof. The fallen star clears a corridor, another opening, totaling the whole. Come back now. It won't come back from where it went. Went nowhere, really, just stayed as if it was. Time, oh, just stayed as it was. Time, event, sense of all this together, become that. That was what won't now come. Call it the outcome. Call mem, Sarah Bernhardt's motto, also mine, <laughs> along with savoir sans dire, for negotiating any situation in Paris, summer 2005, though I never put it fully into practice. I thought if you, you know, because I, I get all choked up with my French. <laughs> and um, I thought I'd just do those two, anything anybody said. Might work. I didn't do it. Reading of a book Robert Haas's called The Apple Trees at Olima, I conceive of another, mine, The Hamburgers at Barney's. Definition of, of abstract, touchless car wash. In 1980s USSR, whenever a governmental crisis arose, the video recording of a single performance by the Bolshoi, Bolshoi Ballet of Swan Lake was aired continuously, day and night, on Soviet TV. Such may be the final issue of the great Russian soul. Staying alive, waste of precious time, get the show on the road. Ancient Stelae. Steli. Here lies Bill. Still. I thought I heard Wynne Knowlton say, Acer Platanoides, Norway maple, tree on a patch of Central Park near the Great Lawn, a favorite play spot of my childhood, where Moses and I unceremoniously and illegally, I in Eleanor's wheelchair, he pushing the handles this way and that, <clears throat> put, just about literally dumped, the mixture of Eleanor and Seymour's ashes in the dire winter 
of 2004. Later, resplendent on an April day, 2009, with yellow-green petals, the, dr the trunk divided in two, stretching up and out against an achingly clear blue sky, across the path, little girls in school uniforms screech under cherry blossoms. The spirit leaves the body, said the ever flat on Alex Katz when I told him how my mother's last breath was taken, then just went. So I'll read a few poems from the end of this book. The last section. Hmm. <clears throat> this is uh, this poem is dedicated to uh, John Godfrey. who's here tonight, and who helped me a lot with this poem really gave both of us a lot of trouble. <laughs> the new sincerity floors us, quarries steam over towers, friendlier than comfort, brings subject home to impetus. That release me tone starts lightly, forms a tree, sheds by light accepted. Insofar as acceptance utters what wants that want not, mere taffeta coinage, Lamia says, loose swerve of sucky, wet flavor pur purse takes charge, where dimension chooses extremities. So the knowing wobble trills, Place thought next to her in water. Put her there then. Why not who you are, who lives, who will tell what differs, condemns the stunner. The fault stays in the picture. Mine has flaws best known for blurs, whose night claws come to crawl, the change to local. A certified risk paddles by at dawn, to, climb you, to claim your bullion for numerous oceans, filed under blossoms compounded, the last fraction greater than day for night. Accounts payable. Somebody down there hates us deeply has planted a thorn where slightest woe may overrun, disorderly and youthful sorrow, many divots picked at since across the thrice-hounded comfort zone. Can't cut it, sees the permanent crone encroaching aside likely lanes of executive tar all spread sideward, skyward. You got the picture, bub. This world is ours no more and those other euphemisms for dimly twisting wrath. A wire mesh semblance bedecked with twilight steamed regard. Look at the wind out there. Delete imperative. Hours where money rinses life like sex, whichever nowadays serves as its signifier. And this is the poem that's in the, uh, the, the program. Is there a program? Oh, oh okay. <laughs> All right. It's just online. Surface Codex, metaphysical. <laughs> this is a metaphysical poem. Remember the metaphysical poem? <laughs> well, I never knew what that meant, metaphysical. <laughs> Now I do. It's online. <laughs> the trouble with makeup 
is online. The trouble with makeup when the face speaks in measured breath, sisters to a faintly large farming operation whose planets abide in the dark mutter of our kind, feed the beast, let convenience have its serious say. The male is here. Her given name is gravity, not a dead unit in sight. Slow turn of syllogism to equal person, blanket promise ineptitude, the gross outcome of a gnat. The little girls all laugh and say, a funny place for a foot rub. The germ in your life, celebrant, best appreciated, should you pick up the phone. <clears throat> This is called uh, First Thing. Drown on all fours. Pennies from a box flood the front market. Blasts of nacre triage under weather's speckled pool. The E-Day fix never happens yet cannot be ignored. Still the moon is half full. Speak for yourself with your hands up. The search is on, search and destroy, if you will. Elimination, starting with a lit fuse, vacuumed anon. Your pleasure is the lee shore. Thunder smites the tundra's paw. This should be memorable. Legs whited out. The runners advance. <clears throat> and the last poem. It's called Room Tone. Wrestling that old beauty, body and soul, to the ground. The genus award for epical comes besotted. Complicity follows like caramel on a sponge mop child-bearing babies on stilts. I dreamed you were felled by an unspecified illness. In yours, I was rowing a leaky boat, even though the motor, the motor, was, fuel, was, the motor was foolproof and bore hairs, taken up with travel and foreign visitors. An intimacy implied in big block letters leans beside its plainer incandescent surrogate. I tend backward haughtily through froth, abandoned sweetness meaning torpor, behind gorgeous intervals of removal and need, an alligator in every pot. Keeping company doesn't count. Dame kind adjusts her ribbon frills. Give life a shot. Circular breath redemption at the door of the wolf. You heard me. Thank you very much. <clears throat>